Hello and welcome to Liquid Margins, another episode of the wonderful show Liquid Margins that Hypothesis uh, hosts. Uh, we're here to talk about inclusivity and social annotation, fostering diverse uh, learning environments. I think it's important to acknowledge that even as we're here to talk about social annotation in relationship to diversity, equity, and inclusion, much of the work of such initiatives takes place well before a tool like Hypothesis enters the conversation. Uh, there's work to diversify our campuses and support diverse communities that are very important and not something for an education technology to solve necessarily. So I would actually like to sort of edit the title here and say fostering equitable learning environments. Um, I do think uh, that social annotation hypothesis play a role in building equitable learning environments in our classrooms, and that's what will be our focus today. I also want to briefly contextualize this discussion within a couple of trends in higher education. One, Diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives have been doing critical work on our campuses and in our classrooms for some time now, but their meanings, the meanings of these words and their structure within universities is becoming highly contested. Secondly, this is happening at the same time as declining enrollments overall that are often more extreme among certain minoritized groups. So we may be stopping uh, or shortening uh, key initiatives even as we need them uh, most. Finally, I want to suggest an inclusive definition for what we mean by diversity, borrowed from the organization Every Learner Everywhere. So when we talk about diversity, and we can debate this if, if, uh, if we feel, when we talk about diversity, we might be referring to any number of the following, minoritized students who have been historically marginalized, such as Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, poverty impacted, transgender, first generation, international, those for whom English is a second language, student parents, student veterans, students with disabilities, or neurodiverse students. With all that said, I am not an expert on this topic. Uh, we've assembled a group of academics who work in this space and who use hypothesis in their classrooms, uh, often to address issues of equity. Um, and if so, they have thought a lot about this topic. So uh, today I am joined by Dr. Sophia Ramming, Associate Director for the Center uh, for the Advancement of Teaching at Florida State University, Catherine Gaffney, uh, from Southern Mississippi State University. She's a PhD student with a focus on disability studies. And Jasmine Noel Yerish, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of District of Columbia, an historically Black university in my hometown of Washington, D.C. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, I totally forgot my housekeeping. Uh, stay tuned for future Liquid Margins episodes. <laughs> um, uh, this is a, a conversation about pedagogical strategies. If you want a demo of how the tool works, there, reach out to Education at Hypothesis. Um, you can drop Q&A questions in the, in the bottom here in the Zoom. Um, and then I think finally closed captioning, you can turn on uh, enable in your, in your Zoom window as well. Uh, so welcome to my colleagues here who I just introduced. Um, I want to start by asking you all, each of you, to tell us a little bit about the school that you teach at, uh, the program you teach in, uh, and any connection you have to DEI or related initiatives uh, on your campus. Um, and maybe we can start with you, Sophia. Thank you. Um, I'm at Florida State University. Uh, we are a top 20 public uh, state university. We are interested in closing opportunity gaps for all um, by improving our teaching and instructional practices, our research, uh, both for faculty and for students. Uh, my particular entrance into that strategic plan is that I run the learning assistant program here at Florida State, and we are focused on closing opportunity gaps in gateway STEM courses. So our ultimate goal is to have more students participating, going into careers, and succeeding in STEM. Excellent. Well, I'm going to go down my Zoom uh, column here and uh, ask Jasmine to go next. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so as said, I'm Dr. Jasmine Noel Yarish at the University of the District of Columbia. I'm a professor of political science there, which is a program within our Division for Social and Behavioral Sciences in the College of Arts and Sciences. So my institution is a historically Black college and university and an urban land grant in university as well. Um, actually, the explicitly, only explicitly urban land grant university in the country. Um, it's also the only public university in our nation's capital. So it's a very unique space with a lot of um, 
a lot of different components. We have a we start as a community college. We have community college branch. We also have PhDs programs in engineering as well as a law school. So it's a very um, uh, inclusive wraparound kind of institution already. There's a lot of diversity when it comes to um, class, ba uh, national backgrounds, so the international students, um, racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, age as well, because a lot of people uh, that are that live in the district, that serve the district, um, you know, they might not have forgotten to got, got to go to school and they come back. So I definitely see my work with um, pedagogical resources. I also um, work closely with our Center for Advanced Learning, um, who have brought kind of hypothesis to our campus, um, spearheaded by actually faculty, um, another faculty in my program. But I work with them to kind of think about how do we um, kind of move the, 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 the indicator, the, 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 our lovely little needle, just farther into the future and kind of bring it together, um, you know, uh, Web 2.0, but also other elements to uh, serve our students where they are, because sometimes they're coming to our classes from home. Sometimes they're coming to our classes commuting. So it's a really great kind of opportunity and Hypothesis does that for us. So I'm glad to have this conversation with everybody today. Excellent, welcome. Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, all. I'm Catherine Gaffney. I'm currently a PhD student in English slash creative writing at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, to describe sort of my situation in the university and the university more broadly, um, I am housed in the uh, School of Humanities alongside history and religion. Um, most of my uh, efforts in relation to DEI operate in the classroom, though I am working to kind of push outside of the classroom as I kind of gain more purchase, both at Southern Mississippi and at future institutions. Um, but I would also say I think my my current uh, situation in relation to DEI is particularly different from my past teaching because I came back to teaching in the throes of the pandemic. I was teaching online entirely and kind of missed the curve of that transition to online. And so I think mm -hmm. I could see the differences in equality and inclusion given the conduit of technology that was we were so dependent upon to operate our classes. And so I was introduced to Hypothesis when I came to Southern Mississippi. And it just, in my experience, has made such a difference both in terms of DEI in relation to disability, but also in terms of socioeconomic status. And then really briefly to talk about Southern Miss a little bit more. Southern Miss is um, not necessarily a fully urban campus, but it's also not necessarily rural, but it does serve quite rural populations in Mississippi. It serves non-traditional students who are coming back to school after maybe a bit of a gap, but then it also serves the traditional college students with dormitories on campus. So it's this really eclectic mix of different kinds of students, and it makes the classroom a really fascinating, diverse space when you're having that correspondence across different types of students. Thanks, Catherine. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, online teaching. Obviously, that adds a sort of another vector to questions of, of uh, inclusion and equi uh, equity. So uh, let's dive into uh, how you all uh, think generally about designing for equity inclusion in your classrooms and the classrooms you support in the case of those that are working with centers for teaching and learning. Maybe we'll go back up the list here, starting with you, Catherine. Just generally speaking, when you're designing a course, how are you thinking about equity as a as a as a you know something that you're trying to achieve in the in the course design? Yeah, I mean, so so my major approaches to creating an equitable classroom are multimodal kinetic kinetic pedagogies, um, and then as well culturally responsive um, materials to hopefully reach those students. And another major way that I can get that access to understand those students is a lot of meta reflection on their identities on their relationships to reading and writing, which is a predominant subject matter that I work with my students on. Um, and those sorts of um, modes and then access points allow me then to kind of adapt my, you know, shell or, or overall trajectory with my students to those specific students and even to specific classes or groups of students within a specific semester. And I can talk more about it in relation to hypothesis, but hypothesis is just an incredible tool that gives unique, I think, insight and access to student processes and uh, thinking avenues. Yeah, we'll dive into the hypothesis specific piece, but really be before we move on to Jasmine, um, can you just define what you mean when you say multimodal and kinetic for our audience? Because I think yeah. those are really great keywords. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what I mean by multimodal is different um, modes of, of media for my students to engage with. So whether that's written alphabetic text 
visual text um, still versus moving text, so videos versus images. Um, and then kinetic, um, I personally, whether I'm physically in a classroom or even in an online space, I want my students moving between different platforms, different kinds of engagements with text. So whether they're reading it without commenting on it, commenting on it, as in the case of hypothesis, writing in response to it in a different document, these kinds of different spaces that they're moving between, moving hence kinetic, I think help stitch neural connections that help with learning. And so I don't want there to be one sort of uniform cadence or path through learning content. I want it to be a constantly shifting nature so that their brains are constantly adapting to the modes that they're encountering course content. I love that. Uh, Jasmine, how do you think generally about uh, equity as you design and lead a course? Well, first I'll just say Catherine already said it really well. So I'll just re-endorse everything she said, but there are kind of four points to, to that I kind of get at. So content choice, um, facilitation, participation and evaluation, right? Those are kind of like our four points when we, every time we build a syllabus. And I think that if you make sure, I, well, at least what I try to do is make sure that equity inclusion is at all levels of that, right? And having multi ways to um, deal with content, right? Of course, we want to have culturally and historically responsive texts and materials for our students so that everyone can find themselves there, right? And, but we also wanna make sure that the facilitation you have times where students actually become facilitators and have different modes in which they they actually engage in facilitation because um, it's such an important right part of the way that we live our lives um, participation that there's multiple ways to participate right that not everybody has to participate the same way not always the most vocal person is the one who's learning through vo being vocal and then finally evaluation right so having reflection journals and quizzes and papers and or projects like having different things because mm. you know um, and spread, spreading them out across the institute, the, the, the semester helps students who feel more comfortable in one kind of evaluation, but maybe need practice in other ones. So kind of finding ways to make the practice part and parcel of like the longer projects. So that's how I build my syllabi. I love that. Sophia, what would you add to this in terms of designing for uh, closing those opportunity gaps, as you said? So for me, in addition to what my fellow panelists have said, I'm designing across uh, six domains uh, that I keep in mind as I plan what I'm going to do uh, with my students who are learning assistants, uh, we call them LAs for short, who are supporting learning in gateway classes. Uh, I'm designing for structure. So I use an active learning approach. I'm driven by the one who does the work, does the learning. So my go my goal is to be a guide, a facilitator. They're the ones actually doing the work. Uh, they are engaged in cognitive kinds of processes, grappling and debating with each other to come to answers or not. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm designing for pattern. My course follows a similar design uh, so that students know what to expect. Uh, they know when the canvas is going to open. Uh, they know the, the day plan is going to follow a, a particular structure. So there's no kinds of left field surprises. Uh, they know what's gonna come. Uh, I designed for processes. So the components uh, asked for open and closed pieces, my feedback to them is timely. Some of them are surprised about the way in which I do that, which is it is done by the time you get back to class uh, so that you have an idea of what was really outstanding, what needs some work, and in all honesty, I never deal or even say, oh, this wasn't good. That's, that's not my approach. Uh, that information, so this is like number four, that information is varied. Um, it is culturally responsive and it is multimodal, which means that some things are in text, some things are in video, some things are audio. And I'm allowing students to approach the content in the way that works best for them. Uh, the five is relationships. It's about building relationships in the larger group. Uh, we create community rules, uh, how we operate with each other because we are reflecting and debating on sometimes hot topics, uh, but also within the smaller groups in which they work. So they're working in bio, so they're the bio team, they're working in chem, there's a chem team. So I tell them, you know, these are your woes who are working with you in your six. You should know these students and they are resources for you as well. Uh, identity, I want them to know that STEM is STEM for all. 
And mm. even though it might appear that your old white guy in a white lab coat, Einstein looking is STEM, this is a myth. Uh, STEM yes. is for everyone. And then we wrap all of that in next generation standards. So some people think it's K-12, but I think they move up into tertiary education so very well. Uh, that idea that STEM is a human endeavor and it's because it's a human endeavor, uh, we need to critique it, unpack mm -hmm. it, and then create and be innovative together. That collaboration is so very important. So I think when I use those seven pieces together, uh, I create equitable experiences in my course uh, for my mm -hmm. students. That's amazing. Uh, Sophia, just one point of clarification. Your training, when you say learning assistance, these are um, like graduate students or that are going to go and support no. gateway courses, or can you explain? No. So learning assistants are undergraduate students who mm -hmm. have passed the class and they've come back uh, to help their peers to better understand the material. So the requirement is they have one semester of FSU GPA and they have passed the class with a B plus or a higher grade. And so they could be like freshmen, but it has to, you know, they have to have their first semester uh, with an FSU GPA of 3.0. And I prepare them because I'm giving them a crash course in teaching and learning in one semester. And yeah. then they take their expertise from their field to go and work with a faculty member uh, to increase learning for students. And that is, that is a goal. We are seeing the evidence of like reduced DFWs, higher grades, and we are pleased with what these students are doing. So it's yeah, that's an equitable kind of uh, approach and right. equity of outcomes for all of our students. Yeah, structurally, it seems a very powerful way to, uh, to support you know, closing those gaps. Um, there's a question from the audience about this topic of multimodality, which I think uh, everyone has touched on here um, before we jump into the annotation uh, specific stuff. Um, how do you balance the multimodal learning approach with the potential to increase extraneous cognitive load or simply I maybe say heavy cognitive load and moving between these different um, uh, medias? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Jasmine. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. It's one that I concern myself with quite a deal, um, especially knowing that students are, especially my students, right? My students who are very, um, coming from so many different angles, coming with so many different things. They have, you know, they might be working full time. They have caretaking responsibilities. They have, um, you know, they're they're having children and <laughs> they have children and their children are having children. <laughs> and there's just so much going on. So it, it, you know, consistency as Sophia was talking about really, really helps. But some, what I like to build in is what I call um, valve releases, <laughs> which means that if say I have um, four reflection journals across the semester, Right, I drop the lowest score at the end of the day, and then I average the other four, the other three for that fourth score for that grouping of that kind of modality for that um, that uh, evaluation piece. Which means if they didn't do one, they got that zero. That zero disappears by the end, right? And if I have a collection of, and so like then I might have two or like three quizzes. Again, short quizzes. I drop the lowest score, average out for the other two, average out for the two for the third score, and it kind of helps, um, um, like. It, it well let me put it this way it challenges them to push but it also doesn't punish them if something happens i want to i hope you don't mind i want to jump in to what you said there because this is so very important for equity of outcomes in my course uh, iteration is important so there is yeah. no assignment that cannot not be redone up until the time i have to submit uh, final grades. This works for me because my courses uh, sections are very small and I can go back and grade up until the last minute. But I'm hoping that students see that iteration is an important component of learning. It doesn't happen in one shot. Go back and do it again. 
Amazing. I'll just Definitely. go ahead and add, add on that, um, you know, Jasmine, it's really interesting to hear. I have very similar students who are dealing with caretaking jobs, all of that. Um, and so one thing I really like to do is I send out a weekly Microsoft, because we have Outlook, Microsoft Forms form where my students have constant access. They don't have to craft an email. They can communicate with me about how they're doing in the class, about what they need from me or what they don't need. So to speak to like the cognitive overload, I try to, I mean, I absolutely, I don't even, well, I guess I try to in the sense that I don't want to pretend I am perfect at it, but I always want to treat my students as experts of their own mental health, although I think we're all working to strive toward that, but I trust their own reflection about what it is they're feeling in the class, how the tools and assignments we're doing are helping them learn. And so sometimes I get organic feedback, but sometimes that form is the way I can say, okay, so maybe doing one more um, hypothesis annotation isn't necessarily going to be the thing that's going to help them achieve their concept of the rhetorical situation, right? Um, and so I want to trust my students in communicating with me and I give them clear avenues to do that in a constant digital modality. That's great. Really appreciate these responses. Um, uh, so I want to turn now to annotation. Um, but I want to move very slowly in this direction. I don't want you to mention hypothesis in this first uh, first response to the question. Just want us to think about annotation. You're all scholars. I imagine you have written in the margins of books that you own. I imagine you've encouraged such behavior perhaps in students, but like, let's talk about annotation and its role in terms of thinking about equity and inclusion at a very broad level. Again, can't say the word hypothesis in your response. Why annotation? What role does annotation as a practice, not a new one, play in uh in, in this in this space this one i'm gonna I'll leave open-ended go ahead Jessica. okay i'm gonna <laughs> jump in um i'm actually gonna tell a story about a fellowship i did when i was a graduate student real quick so i did a fellowship which was an archival fellowship with the german historical institute based in washington dc um, where it brought um american students and graduate students and german graduate students together and did a, we did a two weeks four cities, 12 archives, right? But I'm gonna tell a story about annotation real quick. We went to uh, Harvard's um, Houghton Library, which is a very, it's a rare books library, like very, very, very high end special collections. Like nobody, you can't put your paws on these things, but <laughs> you, I got to go in and we were having a tour of the library and we went into one of the small rooms where the collection of British romantic poetry was. And our tour guide said to us, he's like, who's a fan of Brit Brit British romantic poetry? I was like, Sure, I'm one of those. He's like, okay. He pulls out this uh, this this book, which is actually in a box, which is then in like this satinish silk screen, and pulls it all out. He's like, can you please? And then he opens it up to the book plate and says, could you please read that for us? It was a first edition of Yeats, and it said to my friend Percy. So to Percy Shelley. Mm -hmm. So one of my thing that I'm bringing up here, this is an annotation, right? And he said to us, he's like, why do we have six? first editions, because we have these six first editions, these ones that there are conversations. You can see in the margins where, where Shelley said, oh, that's really good. And then other parts where there's like, oh, that's not so great. <laughs> so you have the, it's it's an interesting conversation amongst the community, right? This is a very specialized community. So let's bring it back down to our students. It's a conversation that they get to have, not just with each other, but with future generations. Um, not, And that's really important, right? The fact that they're having conversations with future generations. I remember buying a book when I was also a graduate student at a conference in Portland, Oregon. And I went to, you know, Powell City of Books. I pulled a book off the shelf. I opened it up, the book plate. It's signed by Angela Davis. Of course, mm. I bought that book, <laughs> right? I'm a political scientist who studies abolition democracy. I bought that book and I have that book. I didn't have it signed by her, but I have her signature in that book. So again, I think of it as a conversation, not just in real time, but in historical kind of footprints. I love that. Anybody to add? And remember, you can't use the word hypothesis in your response. I didn't. Oh, did you I? did great. Oops. Yes, you did. You did a job. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. Um, I would say uh, for me, the annotation is sometimes a conversation with myself. I tell my students, I said, I need to make my thinking, my unpacking, my struggling, my problems with the text uh, clear for me to think about it some more because it's all caught up in here, right? We talked about cognitive load. So much is happening that I write in the margins. I don't know where this, what is it all about? Or, oh, I need to look further into this piece here. Or I give my thoughts 
if the author, you know, gives a question and there's nothing like coming back to a book like two years later and you have forgotten what you have written. And sometimes you have answers to the questions now because you've grown as a scholar, maybe as a practitioner. Um, and sometimes it's just cute to see what you were thinking about at that moment on those pages and whether it's an academic book or some kind of like book for pleasure, it's good to see what your brain was doing at that point in time. And, and I try to share that kind of practice with my students, make your thinking transparent. And just the fact that you're talking about their thinking or like my thinking and that that's part of the conversation. It's not just what is the author thinking or what does the teacher want that it's empowering that voice for yourself like my, my thinking matters, I'm gonna put it down. And your thinking matters, your students, put it down, work through it, it doesn't have to be finished. Um, I love that. Anything to add, Catherine? I love yeah. these stories. I was gonna say, I mean, I have a story that like beautifully plugs into the idea of empowerment. I was just catching up with a student um, from a previous semester on Tuesday, and they were sort of reflecting on their work on Amy Tan's essay, Mother Tongue, um, and how they were kind of really, um, so I'm teaching like analysis, specifically rhetorical analysis in the class the student was in. And they were reflecting on, on how the fact they were so glad that they sat with the text annotated it, read it, because there's this like archaeological process they're going through initially in isolation of trying to like understand their understanding of the text, because then they started to Google around a little bit and kind of do some research on the essay. And they started finding, I'm sure these like schmoop or other kinds of, you know, like cliff notes type, you know, platforms, their readings of the text. And the student was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I read the text and annotated it myself first, because had I read the schmoop digestion of the text, I wouldn't have had the analysis and insights and reading of the essay that I had for myself. And so there's this empowerment with the process of annotation that that student's perspective and reading of the text is not only valid, but gives greater insight into our understanding of a particular text. I love this. All right, now we can talk about hypothesis. Now you can actually use the word. Uh, let's go through and just hear about how you're using hypothesis in the classroom with some, you know, a gesture towards how it's helping with the, you know, topics, the the sort of teaching philosophies around equity and inclusion that we've that we've talked about. Um, and maybe this time we'll start with you, uh, Sophia. The first uh, part of the pedagogy course that I teach for the LAs uh, is based around readings about teaching and instruction, and they are uh, housed in the hypothesis tool in Canvas. And I'm telling them that as a qualitative researcher, annotations are so very important to me as I'm reading uh, the data that I have from people that I interview, and that reading a book, your thoughts, like I said, are made transparent. I tell them that I want them to anchor the piece that, here's my word I use with them, lands on them, and then unpack what that means in the annotation space. Uh, I tell them that they are researchers as well. They are creators of knowledge, uh, subjects in this thing that we do in higher ed, and not everything that someone says is true or for you, and you can create uh, a line of thought, a line of inquiry as well. And then when you're collaborating with your peers because they're responding to you through uh, the hypothesis and they're learning to make claims and support arguments with text, other texts, links to text, uh, videos that support what they're sharing, I think they become critical thinkers. And part of what we hope to have, right? A flourishing democracy of people who are critical thinkers. So that, that's a constant like encouragement for me. I'm saying everybody participates in this activity. We're all creators of knowledge. And this is the first step. Read and then respond. Reflect, respond. Debate, respond. Collaborate, respond. Yeah. I love that. Students as knowledge producers. We're all knowledge producers. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine, any, uh, how do you use hypothesis in the classroom? How do you, in the context of uh, equity? Yeah, I mean, I use it in so many, so many ways because um, I really try to beyond like the anchor textbook for a class, also like curate readings to respond to my students, their experiences that I gain from these reflections, like I mentioned, 
But I think for this question, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how I use it for um, reading the syllabus and then also building rubrics in my class, which I think, um, to me to answer one of the questions in the chat, really speaks to being able to build equity, um, especially with um, first generation students or non traditional students in an online space. Because um, I think the thing that can sometimes, I mean, I don't like this, this room necessarily, but I think sometimes it can be easy to forget that the syllabus is this very strange genre that students may not have had experience with, or even a rubric is kind of a strange genre. And so the collective knowledge building, to borrow some of um, Sophia's language, um, is really important in being able to decode and make that document equitably comprehensible to all. And more, what's more is I think being able to decode, I also use it for assignment sheets, but being able to decode the class expectations in the syllabus and specific assignment ex expectations via the collective social annotation, one, peers are helping each other understand some of the language in the syllabus and the assignment sheet. And then down the road, um, I generally the first unit, I'll make a rubric for them just to kind of in we'll decode that via hypothesis. But then after that first unit, I have students use hypothesis to build rubrics, which A, gives them agency in relation to the evaluation process, to kind of borrow some of um, Jasmine's elements of, you know, approaching course crafting in an equitable manner, um, and then also gives them the opportunity to see their voice in that genre that they've already encountered in other classes and in my class myself. So really trying to get students um, asserting themselves and, and empowering themselves in relation to the assignments, um, the genres, and even the grading process. I love that. Yeah. It's almost like co-designing. Sorry, Jasmine, go ahead. No, 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 absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, um, so I want to actually circle back and add in the question that was in the chat. Do you teach online and hybrid courses and can you really share any specific ways in which you build equity and inclusion online in online environments? And I say hypothesis is my answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because um, I started my my position at UDC in pandemic fall. What does that mean fall 2020, right? And that's when I started at the institution. I was teaching explicitly from my apartment in a completely different city, right? My home city of Philadelphia. I have no buy-in with my students. I'm not I did not want to require them to put on their screens. I did not want to require them to do all the things because it's like, we don't ethically can't really ask them to do that at that time. It just didn't feel right. And um, what I did was build hypothesis assignments when I learned about it um, as, a, as, a, as a feature and a tool uh, that would be like, okay, you guys can do this in real time while we're talking about it now um, and get some questions done tonight, like just in real time, just one thing. And then by the end of the weekend, right, you can respond to a peer and it gives them time to reflect and take space, right? And, not, and, and also to get them to recognize if you're not, if you haven't read before class started today, that's okay. It's not a big deal, right? Um, some of them, some, uh, there was a, a point where I had everything be a hypothesis reading. And then I was like, okay, this is like, no, I'm going to cut back on that um, and make, you know, maybe I'll have an hypothesis and they can use it to talk to themselves if they need to. But there will be hypothesis assignments where I check with them. And those are shorter and they're more updated or they're more current eventy like things, right? And that kind of helps them ground really, really old texts because I teach political philosophy. <laughs> They're reading 19th century John Stuart Mill on like liberty. What does this mean? And, and, and you know, lots of weird verbose stuff. Um, and translations are always interesting. But um, then they get to read something that's like more contemporary. What is neoliberalism? How does this connect back to these kind of questions of marketplace of ideas that John Stuart Mill created? And it helps kind of um, get them to translate on their own. But what I really, really love, um, and this is what Sophia was saying about the teaching program that they have at, at, at FSU, it's that students lead the way, right? And hypothesis allows students to lead the way. Um, and it allows us to see how they are taking on the roles of leaders and leadership. And that's kind of where it comes back to for me. So I want to add just one last piece, if you don't mind, Jeremy, is, and this concerns my international students and really uh, students who uh, their first kind of response to you give me an answer is to be like deer in the headlights. A hypothesis is a great way for them to have the opportunity to take time, reflect, but then to use additional tools to help them to share the thinking that they want to do with their peers. So 
they may have written up their substantive post and they could have used a uh, grammarly to check for that, you know, that their grammar and punctuation and all that stuff. And they bring that now to hypothesis. They're proud of it. It's well done. I had time. And it's not me putting them on the spot. Traditionally, you're walking around. Tell me about the reading. Tell me about the reading. They, it's low stakes, low pressure. And for me, I think you get a, a better and more robust, sorry, robust response from your students uh, because they have had time to gather resources and think about it. And I just want to add one more thing, Jeremy, not to be um, continue to like have codas to this conversation, but um, <laughs> I think that um, what you were talking about um, is really lovely, especially for neurodivergent students, right, where that like vocal contribution to the classroom isn't something they may necessarily feel immediately comfortable with, or it's something they want to move toward, grow toward as they navigate this social space. So when I teach in person and use hypothesis, I love having the hypothesis annotations projected on the screen so that I can kind of bring in those written contributions from that student who may not necessarily want to participate in that particular vocal modality or any other kinds of non-written modalities. So just bringing in that neurodivergent element. And I just threw in the chat on that. Um, two, uh, three of my peers at the University of the District of Columbia produced a really great piece about that very thing, universal design, neurodivergency, and hypothesis itself. So I threw that in the chat. So if people wanted to take a look at it, they have it. Yeah, that's a that's a really excellent piece. Um, thanks for sharing that, uh, uh, Jasmine. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more here in terms of the ways that we encourage um, students to, um, you know, share their voices, their diverse perspectives, um, uh, and the way that we encourage different students to participate. Um, can any of you speak a little bit more just about, I mean, sounds like you're saying, well, this tool just naturally allows anybody to, uh, to speak their perspective, um, and I appreciate that. It's a good tagline, but there's, you know, how do you, what else do you do to support um, students sharing their specific perspectives, you know, knowing that their voice matters um, and getting participation from a wider group? Any strategies there or more to speak about in terms of how annotation can amplify student voice? Yeah, I think that's great. Sophia, think, do you want to go first, please? I'm going to go quick, quick, quick and, and, and let you take over. I think you probably have a very great answer. My, my thing has been about submitting a piece of work that that I have to be flexible in the way that my LAs want to submit a response to something, mm -hmm. which we learned uh, with hypothesis. And I didn't know it at first, actually. I had to do Hypothesis Academy. And then I learned how students can add the videos and the memes and the pictures, uh, sometimes a YouTube video. And I accept that as a response, as long as I and their peers can see a direct link to what it is that we're talking about. And so that flexibility on my part, I think, uh, allows the hypothesis to uh, have students give voice in multiple ways about what they're thinking. Thanks, Jasmine. No, not a worries. And I wanted to say, like Catherine said earlier about how, you know, we get entry into this tool for students. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of conversation about using the syllabus as like their first kind of like tool. But I actually, there's a really great YouTube video that's from 2013 to 2013. That seems like, well, a decade ago. Um, that is actually Hypothesis' own little video. And I threw it in the chat so people can have it uh, real quick. But I usually use that to introduce students to Hypothesis because sometimes they're just like, ah, tool, overwhelming. I don't know what to do. What am I doing? How am I doing this? Mm. It's like, okay, nice. let's talk about what this tool can do, not just in the LMS platform. Like it was really important that a hypothesis, and Jeremy, you wrote a really great write-up of, you know, the launching of hypothesis as an app for LMS systems. And that changed, I think, the game for hypothesis, but also changed Little the game for us. Yes. Right again. Sorry about that. I couldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. Um, that's, you know, perfect, perfect pedagogical interruption. Um, but yeah, so it, we have this as a as a tool, but it persisted, right? It, it precedes mm -hmm. that. Hypothesis precedes that. Yep. And it actually precedes 2013. But I love this little, like, beautiful animated video that reminds us that what does it mean to be human? It means to use language, 
right? To engage in conversation and discourse. And how is it that we've created more tools to do that? And how are we expanding that? So I want to, I always try to encourage my students to, to think, you know, learn, you know, well, yes, you're being asked to use this tool. Yes, maybe you don't want to use this tool. And yes, sometimes it's hard getting you to use this tool. And here, I'm going to use Hypothesis as a quiz tool, which I can talk about later, or if people have questions mm. about it, I will in a second. But you're also learning a tool which means this is a company, which means this is a thing you could actually say as a skill that you can go out into yeah. the world with and take it to new spaces. So I love coming back to that video for them and I wanted to share that. I just wanna add one thing to that Jasmine in terms of, you know, I think there's a phrase um, like disposable assignments, like this assignment is disposable, it's something you do for a class um, and not necessarily useful beyond that um, uh, in, a, in other courses even or beyond the, the context of formal education. I like to t also talk about the idea of disposable tools. And so you're talking about um, non-disposable skills that are being practiced here, deeply human, um, but also maybe workplace uh, relevant skills, but also a tool that you can then use, you know, the non-LMS version of hypothesis per personally or professionally beyond, you know, and, and, and I think that's a uh, a neat and unique thing. I don't think a lot of education technologies are necessarily going to be used beyond um, beyond the context of a classroom. And so I think that's a valuable thing that we're offering students when we when we use a tool like this. Uh, I can't remember if we've circled back to you, Catherine, if you want to add anything more about uh, student voice and uh, encouraging participation. Yeah, I think it plugs in a little bit to what Sophia mentioned earlier, um, not just multimodal contributions, which I think are really cool and really great and speak to, I think, neurodivergences as well. But I also encourage students to like ask questions. They don't have to have mm. everything solved by the time they write that in annotation in the hypothesis um, interface, you know, they can still be um, on that line of inquiry or that line of discovery. Um, and so I really want to work with students, um, especially those who, um, you know, in the first year writing classroom and, and sometimes in the it's controversial terms, developmental basic writing, there's a lot of terms, that, the perfect term has not been found yet for that, that writing space. Um, but there's a lot of anxiety about writing, about engaging with text, about reading comprehension. And so I often find that question access point to be an, another really inclusive way for students to engage with text. And then what's really beautiful about hypothesis, because I equally require peer responses, is that their peers often answer the questions of the person posing the question, right? And so that peer-to-peer -peer learning operates really, really naturally in hypothesis. Right. The, the peer to peer is another piece of this, right? There's the student's voice, but the idea that you're working with others, I feel like is a big part uh, that you have a community that can support you, answer questions, build with you, challenge you, um, uh, is, a, is a part of, I think, also developing an equity, uh, you know, oriented uh, learning environment. Um, and I, I really appreciate what you said there, Catherine. You know, there's multimodal, like you could use a meme or you could use alphabetic text. Um, but even within those multiple media responses, there's also different, I'm trying to think, genres of response. I mean, one thing that I've seen that's very powerful to me is um, some, and you can do this across a course, right, where you sort of say, um, in this first reading that we're annotating, I just want your personal reaction. I just want to know how does this connect to your life, what things that have happened in, in your life, right? And you can build that towards something, you know, more explicitly academic, right, offering some kind of, you know, uh, theoretical analysis, right? But both of those genres, even if they're both alphabetic, they could also both be memes, I suppose, but um, is important, right? Again, they're. I guess it's still a modality thing, right? To say, tell me about your personal experience. Now let's move to this other modality, which is, you know, some kind of uh, theoretical framework that we're bringing to it from maybe in your context, Jasmine, all the historical figures that we're reading, you know, like what would John Stuart Mill think about this? <laughs> um, and that's a step beyond like your own personal response to the philosophy. By the way, I had to teach John Stuart Mills on liberty when I was at UT, and we we were required to use it in our freshman comp classes. It was the <laughs> first time they hadn't used a modern text. It was, it was quite a challenge, definitely uh, something that requires annotation. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move on. I want to. So we talked a lot about student voice. Um, I want to talk about the teacher presence, and maybe just a quick poll here. Like, are y'all annotating? with uh in the same text or do you do you sort of let it be a student place or do you switch that up at, at different times what's your role in do, do you annotate what's your role in the annotation conversation i guess i'll jump in um a lot of times my role is simply to put in the directions i love to use the 
page notes section for mm. directions for students. Um, but I have also done annotations where I'm like, so in my one class, I teach a class on um, the politics of prison abolition um, and their readings for that class, I have them find something like they, they have a list of in the page notes, I have them have a list of um, key terms that I want them to find the definitions for in the text, right? And to then write it out in their own words. Um, now, I always have to come back to my students and say, you lost points because you just you found it and then you went to a different website for the definition. That's not what I asked you. <laughs> I want you to tell me what the how the author is explaining this, not what Webster says. Yes, Webster is helpful and thank you for that. That's additional, but please do the assignment. Um, but I also have them uh, connect, like find something in the text and then create a question connecting it to um, our main text of the class, which is watching, well, at that time was watching Orange is the New Black and a particular episode. So I, um, I, would, I would also give them an example, right? So we just watched this episode, I do one and I tag it with question. So I tell them, you can either develop your own question or you can answer mine. But if you answer my question, you have to give a different answer than somebody who also answered the question. So to, you know, expand the conversation. Um, so I've definitely done that. Uh, that's kind of how I see myself. So I am annotating mostly throwing directions because I don't want to do too much for them. I want to give them some little crumbs. Earlier in the semester, I probably do a little bit more annotating. Later in the semester, probably not so much. Mm. But interesting, your thoughts tie back. I think Sophia was talking about just like explicit structure um, is important. Um, Sophia, I, I saw you about to talk before I interrupted, sorry. Uh, I just finished uh, cohort two with Christy and the other team. It was marvelous. And there was a piece of it that I had not thought about because to your question, I let students uh, have a conversation among themselves in the hypothesis. And I had never joined in that conversation except to bring people back if they had gone too far afield, uh, there, was a, there was a note that you could leave what I would call, I guess, like that was a crumbs along the way in the reading questions that you might want students to ask. Well, I stole that Im immediately. Um, and I used the A from tag and dropped my crumbs in my article that I had uh, for students to read for my, it's, it's an outside program, but I'm using hypothesis everywhere. And everywhere I go, I tell people, oh, you need to get this tool if you have Canvas so that I can do what I need to do, uh, spreading the word. And so I use the A from TAG and told them to do starters using that, you know, that group of questions. And I said, I have a question, answer it, and then ask a question with one of the, one of the starters from, from TAG. And that was awesome. Um, I can't say enough how much the Hypothesis Academy, the, the, the activities have added to what I, what I used to do, what I'm practicing now, what I hope to do in the fall in, in a bigger way. Uh, definitely just that collaboration with others was so okay. very helpful. A shout out to Christy, one of our customer success managers who I know is helping out in the chat who, uh, who uh, founded and, and, and runs Hypothesis Academy. But Sophie, could you just say a little bit more about where you're talking about with tagging? I didn't totally follow the A tagging. Oh, so there's a, there's a, so one of the, I don't know if my other panelists have this, have, if either of them have this issue, is that you say, write a substantive post about, you know, like anchor your, 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 your response with your highlighting so everybody knows what you're talking about. Make it substantive. Make sure you're following these things we've talked about in class. And then I say, respond to two of your peers. And the response is, I agree with you. That was a great thought. And that's the response in the beginning. Usually you have to move them away from agreeing with everything and then saying, oh, yes. I, and then just restating what Jasmine said. Nothing that's their thoughts. They're just summarizing and restating what she said. So tag is a way to, to encourage student responses in a very different way. And I, I, I call it a goal. I was like, yes, this is what I'm going to do. And I did it immediately. The A is ask. And it has okay. uh, starters for the ask. And so I use those as crumbs through the reading. I started with my starter question. And then I say, respond to this. And then you need to ask a question using the same kind of format. 
hoping that this will be uh, a permanent thing because it was really good. I got some good questions uh, from students uh, and, and I'm like, yes, this was it. This is what was missing. So stole it immediately. <laughs> I think that's the idea. Steal this pedagogy. Exactly. Um, and Christy's dropped in the tag protocol in the in the in the um in the chat here. I think I was getting confusing because we have a tag feature, lowercase okay. tag. No, 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 um, but this at is the bottom. Helpful. No, there's yeah. Things. Yeah, that I'm like, yes, I love it. I've used it That's already great. and it's working. Catherine, I, I, uh yeah, sorry, go participation? ahead. Jeremy. No, just I want to yeah. hear about whether you participate in the conversation or let it be a student space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, I want to say that I had not heard of the tag protocol, so that's something I'll look into because definitely, Sophia, I encounter that, you know, I agree, great post or, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, part of me, especially in an online classroom, I try not to like grade too heavily because just like if you're, you're having an, in, a vocal conversation in person, you wouldn't necessarily say to that student who raised their hand and said, I agree with so-and-so, you wouldn't say, oh, that's not a good contribution to the classroom, right? You would be wanting to encourage that kind of vocal conversation. So I think the level of like critique of annotations depends on like class modality and also learning goals, which I think plays into my role in the annotation sphere. So part of first year writing, one of and for many institutions, one of the learning outcomes is learning how to annotate. Um, and so it seems really important to me in that particular environment to model annotation for my students. So I don't do too many. I'll do maybe, depending on the length of the text, like four to seven, maybe, just for them to see what I'm observing in the text, what kinds of observations or questions I'm asking of the text. Because mm -hmm. even though you can read about annotation all day until you see it in that book, like Jasmine described earlier, you know, open yes. that book, it doesn't feel like a real thing. You have like your pen in hand, you're like, cool, I'm starring this poetic line. That doesn't mean anything to me, right? Mm -hmm. So I think modeling is really important. And then depending on the nature of the text, um, I will respond to like questions, especially on the syllabus or the assignment sheet. Um, and I just want to also circle back that I, I so agree, Sophia, that those like I agree don't really, it's like the checkbox for that student, right? They're, they haven't yet fully engaged with their peers response. Um, so I'm definitely going to try that tag protocol to kind of press them and, and sculpt that response. So the organic response isn't just when they raise their hand to like mirror in the classroom, when they raise their hand, isn't just, I agree, it becomes that more critical discourse with their peers. So I just wanna like say, I so admire it, but my, my reticence has been to like fully critique because in the asynchronous space, I don't wanna push back against students vocalizing in any way, shape or form, because I'm just excited they're there. Yeah. Anyway, I'll cut my response there. I love so much that you tied that back to Jasmine's anecdote about seeing the uh, to Percy in the in the book to sort of just visualize your intervention in the text that can be so sort of professional and distance, you know, like what's my role here? And then suddenly you can see it when you're like, oh, this is how the modeling helps with that. Um, so I want to close out here uh, talking about evaluation. Um, we can so I might just ask, you know, what is the role of evaluation uh, with hypothesis and uh, and social annotation in your courses? Are you grading annotations? Um, and also, you know, how, yeah, let's start there. Yeah, so I wanna circle back real quick and I wanted, I threw another resource in the chat from higher ed. Um, this is actually about OED, so Open Education uh, Resource, or OER, OER. <laughs> Why did I say D? Nah. Um, I was universal design. Anyway, confusing my acronyms. Um, but I do think that what Hypothesis built upon is like OED, which is a longer conversation than, that we've been having across the uh, issues of equity and inclusion, affordability as a first generation student myself um, to go to undergrad, let alone to go get a graduate degree. Like, don't ever know what that means, but, you know, the affordability of books has always been, a, you know, of materials has always been a concern. Um, and I do think that hypothesis we can actually um, evaluate the impact of social annotation by seeing how this how students get involved in creating OER. Um, and mm -hmm. hypothesis is one step to that, right? It's like practicing that at the beginning. How do you practice this? And then how do you do it? And how do you build? And how do you scale up all of these concerns? So I think that that's one way to do it. Um, I said earlier that I have, I've started using um, a hypothesis as a, a, for a quiz. And what do I mean by that? Um, I do a lot of close reading. Close reading analysis is a, is a tool, is a method, lit, is it political theory uses it we all use it right policy analysis uses it 
But um, because of the kind of generational shifts in how reading practices are happening, right? We all talk about, oh, people aren't reading anymore. Actually, they are. We're reading way more than we used to. We're just not doing long, sustained, deep reading anymore, right? We're just mm -hmm. we're reading so much that we don't have time to sit down with a full book or to get in deeper to a text. So what's great is that you can use the hypothesis group function to create individual assignments for each of your students and just be like, okay, here's four points. I want you to find these four points, right? And those four points could be two of them are content questions and two are actually application questions where they're pulling in something from earlier in the course that they read and trying to put it to bear. And that's a really great kind of function I think that Hypothesis gives us as a tool. We can do the social annotation, right? I usually do that, they practice that, but then really show me how you individually, you person, you here and now are showing me your literacy. Um, mm -hmm. Deep literacy is very important to democracy. We know how important it is right now. Yeah. So I think hypothesis can be used in that way and very effectively. And are you using like groups of one for that? Like where you create yes. multiple groups? Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. So I go in and like one group one, one person's in that group. Group two, one person's in that group. Yep. Yeah. Moving between the collaborative and the and the individual like that. Yep. Anybody else have anything to add about evaluation? Sophia, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna say that in the fall I had 150 LAs in class spread across three sections. So this is this is a feature that I really love about hypothesis. Um, first, I merged those three sections into one section in my view in Canvas. And then hypothesis mirrors that, right? And so when I put in a reading in one canvas, that went to all three sections. And then the responses I could filter down by section and by student. And it made the grading so much easier. I didn't have to go from canvas to canvas to canvas because it was all in one. And then hypothesis joined in with that, like putting it all in one. And I just needed to filter for what I wanted, a particular student or a particular section. Uh, the rubrics, I had been using one, but again, I'm going to plug cohort two. I have stolen one already from that teaching. I shared it in my assignment because I fell in love with it uh, because I had a holistic one and I realized this is it. I need a more analytical a rubric and I'm busy. When am I going to make it? But here is the perfect one. And I grabbed that too. So the platform provides you with these resources that you can, you know, start off with. And if you want to like tinker with it, make it more individualized, it's up to you. But you don't have to start from zero. How am I going to do this tomorrow? And I got to make a rubric. And a, no, it was right there. And I love it. I'm like, I'll be using that in the fall. I have to kind of shorten our conversation here because we uh, have a couple of things I need to get out of, of the way before we uh, finish out the hour. Um, I've so enjoyed this conversation. I did just want to quickly add like, we're talking about student voice and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask like, have you gotten feedback from students about hypothesis and social annotation? Want to share any anecdotes around what students think themselves? I get <laughs> uh, Catherine? So, sorry, really quick. I get so much feedback that they absolutely love it. Students, I, they, they, in my evaluations, I get like hypothesis mentioned. So I'll just leave that briefly there. Awesome. They love not having to buy a book. There's yeah. nothing like not having to buy a book. <laughs> so I choose my resources, open resources, yes, yes. Uh, to make sure that I'm democratizing access. We don't need yeah. to spend $100 on a book. There's a PDF and we're going to use it for, for, for our learning. So they love that. The one response that I've gotten before is there is a hypothesis drain for all of us who are using it. So sometimes the students are like, oh, I don't want one more hypothesis reading to do, which is, a, it's an important feedback. So if those of you yeah. who are building brand new courses for the first time, um, definitely check out Liquid Margins. We've had conversations, there have been conversations about that before, how much to use it, when to use it, how to use it. I think these are all really important questions. The students do love it when you use it effectively. So um, I'll throw that there. Yeah, balance, moderation. Uh, well, I just want to close out by those of uh, you that are not yet Hypothesis customers or your institutions are not yet Hypothesis customers to let you know that we are offering a summer boost promotion right now, which is discounted pricing for our summer term. It's a great time to 
play with the tool uh, in a few courses ahead of the, the fall semester for a more complete adoption. It, it does offer unlimited access, so any course in teaching this summer can use it, um, and there's no cost, additional cost for the integration. You can have access to Hypothesis Academy. There's already emails coming that I can see of people asking, like, when's the next cohort? So thanks for the plug, Sophia. It really is an amazing program. It's a deep discussion of the pedagogy of using this tool, as well as some basics of how to. Um, so please reach out about the Summer Bruce promotion. If you end up, if your school ends up, up uh, you know, getting the contract in place for multiple years, the cost of the Summer Boost promotion goes to, um, to that contract. So um, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Uh, I really admire each of you as, as instructors. I want to take all your courses. So uh, thanks, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts about uh, equity and inclusion and also about annotation. And uh, I hope the conversation continues with us in, in other contexts, including on the page in, in annotations. Thank you. I've learned so much from all of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Have a wonderful everybody. day. We'll be sending out the recording and information about Hypothesis Academy, and there's also going to be a workshop uh, specifically about inclusion uh, that we're going to be running um, on April 13th. And so I'm sure there's lots of ideas that were expressed here that might be included as we design that for uh, sort of more practical the conversation here. How do we turn around and apply some of these ideas in the classroom? Um, so thanks so much, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon. Go forth and annotate. <laughs>